Hello, this is Brent Anderson, and welcome to another Pilates Hour. And today I'm really excited to have a dear friend and guest, Beth Kaplanik, who um, unfortunately we don't have her video today. We've had a little bit of technical difficulty at the facility that she's at, uh, but we do have her voice. So welcome, Beth. We're glad to have you, and and uh, I think we got a very exciting topic to discuss today. Just confirm what I hear your voice there. I am very happy to be here and be with you, Brent, so we can discuss something that's near and dear to both our hearts. <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, you know, Beth and I share a lot of things in common in our own bodies um, on top of our love for Pilates and on top of our medical profession. So let me just introduce Beth formally. She is uh, trained as a registered nurse. Uh, she has worked in mental health as well and education. Uh, she has been a Pilates teacher. She originally was trained in the classical method. She had then added Polestar's method uh, to that and has become an educator for Polestar. She is an author of a book of, uh, about Pilates with people with total joint replacements and osteoarthritis. She has courses on osteoarthritis. She prevents workshops. She's been at the PMA. She's taught for us in Polestar. She's an educator for Polestar. And uh, she also teaches. We're so lucky to have her at our facility in Miami. And I can't think of any patients that I haven't uh, sent to Beth that come back with rave reviews, sort of knowing that we've been a nice match, Beth, in the uh, working with sort of that complex population, being able to have Pilates. And I want to say one other thing um, is that, you know, you've never pampered my patients. You know, you've always sort of no. pushed them. And I, I think this is a very important point. And it's also because we push ourselves. Um, Beth and I both have had joint replacements and have suffered from um, arthritic pain ourselves, but uh, strive to do all we can to stay up on the science and to stay healthy. So Beth, thank you again for joining me today on the Pilates Hour. And uh, maybe share a little bit about where your passion for osteoarthritis comes from outside of our own our own pain, our own joint replacements. But, uh, you know, sort of, you, know, you also have a passion for bone, de uh, bone density and osteoporosis. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so tell a little bit about yourself. Well, you know, I was kind of one of these jocks in school and I really liked p pushing myself in every way. and. Um, and then I became a nurse and then I was involved with, you know, medicine from a different perspective. And then I started really looking at the full body and really wanting to work more for the physical side and started to have pain in my right hip from walking up a hill and coming down because I was very athletic. And that led me on a journey knowing that I needed a right hip replacement to look into finding, once I had my hip replacement, the right form of movement that would benefit me in the conditions that I had, which was a bilateral hip condition at the time. And, you know, that's how I found Pilates. And then I realized that my chronic condition with the base of it was I developed osteoarthritis due to the con deformity that I had in both my hips. But I also have it in my knees and, and my fingers. So I am one of those classical people who definitely lives with a bit of osteoarthritis. And because of Pilates and the work that I have been doing in the field and researching and looking at and modifying and accommodating and sort of just you know, pitch hitting, trying to find the right way to work with myself, it benefited me the opportunity to work with others with similar conditions. And I think of everything, and I, I was a full uh, fitness jock, and we're talking about, I taught sculpting, and I taught aerobics, I did all of that. And then I found Pilates when I had my hip replaced. And there was not, no better movement than I, and everything I've done that, worked my body in a full body routine, a full body movement program, not just isolating a joint by itself, and did a benefited all of myself and be able to help me find realignment and congruency and uh, proper load based on demand. And that's what makes it good for this, pro uh, the, this population of osteoarthritis is finding the right load based on their ability and the range of motion that they can do within an area without pain not that you don't have to push them. So I became more and more passionate about osteoarthritis, even though I speak about all kinds of other disabilities related to the hip and knee, 
I think osteoarthritis is one of the hardest things to talk about and work with as an instructor in a way because it's chronic. We don't do enough in this world with osteoarthritis. We don't have enough preventive stop and improve strategies in this world of medicine for osteoarthritis, like we do with so many other things that we can, that patellofemoral syndrome of the knee or something where that let's, could be. Let's important. talk about that a little bit. Let's talk about this idea of, you know, the prevalence of osteoarthritis. That means how frequently it occurs. Yes. Um, there have been there have been blind studies where they look at large populations, you know, thousands of people that have never had any joint pain, and they've done MRIs and X-rays of them and found that you know there's a high prevalence and incidence of osteoarthritis in these joints, whether it's the spine or the knee or the hip or the shoulder, um, in people that don't have pain. And so we right. have. You know, the idea is that people between the age of 18 and 100, you know, in, in their perspective, respective age brackets, um, have significant degenerative changes in their joints. And so, you know, in the healthcare industry, we ask ourselves, is, you know, is this a normal progression of the human, um, or, you know, uh, joint and skeleton? Uh, right. as we age, which we think that's obviously the case. The same with bone density. There's a, a normal degeneration of bone density. The question is, is when does it become pathological? When does it become interfere with function? And how does, you know, what other factors are involved um, or comorbidities with uh, painful, let's say, let's, mm -hmm. Let's make a classification, Beth, and talk about um, symptomatic osteoarthritis, where people are actually having symptoms. Right. And what are some things, what are some of the other factors that we see or other diseases that accompany um, osteoarthritis in the community, especially painful arthritis? You know, uh, when you have a metabolic disorder like diabetes or cardiac issues, sometimes you have a lot of correlation with osteoarthritis because of the metabolic chemical things that are going on in the body. And that inflammatory mechanism is constantly on and then starts to wear and tear at the articular cartilage and then exposes the bone below the cartilage and then it starts to develop sclerotic areas and osteophytes. So that's right. one related coexisting situation. Um, yeah. and, and with that metabolic disorder, we see obesity as being... Obesity. Mm -hmm. you know, huge factor in painful arthritis. I mean, right. some people might have the same arthritis, but they don't have the obesity. It's likely that they might not have the same level of symptoms when they lose weight, right? Somebody that, uh, I mean, that's probably one of the best treatments I find for painful arthritis is to, you know, lose weight. And a lot of times the, the weight is due to right. or related to metabolic disorders as you're talking about. So whether it's you know, diabetes or, um, you know, high LDLs and some of the other triglycerides right. and, and blood fat levels, sugar levels um, that are related to inflammation. You know, this is a, this is a hot topic right now, inflammation. Right. I mean, talk, yeah, there you is. Know, most of our um, autoimmune diseases, um, most of our pain diseases, a lot of even things like um, Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease are also thought to be uh, inflammatory related diseases so right. you know what you know where do we go from here as a conscious community of movement professionals pilates teachers physical therapists gerontonic teachers yoga teachers in our education and the language that we use when we talk to our clients that might be suffering from painful arthritis and and i do need to make a clarification here and i i don't think i made it clear enough um you know, arthritis basically means that there arthra is joints and itis is inflammation. So there are many types of arthritis. Um, in this particular workshop, Beth and I are talking about osteoarthritis, which is a degenerative arthritis. Right. Um, it's not a systemic disease like rheumatoid arthritis or psoriasis or lupus or some of the other autoimmune um, systemic diseases that also result in joint degeneration. Um, right. Osteoarthritis is less of a systematic disease, even though we see it 
systemically, right? So you might, you know, see it in in various joints, and it sort of has unique joints. And one of the 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 big uh, contributors to osteoarthritis is previous injuries. So that's why that when you talked earlier about you know your sport and athleticism, and of course, you know a lot of you know my story of pole vaulting in high school, college, and then again another era in my midlife crisis of pole vaulting in my 40s. Um, you know, that those types of injuries, sprained ankles, torn ligaments in the knee, surgery of the knee, sprained hips, overactive hips and dance and, and you know, aerobic exercise, that um, a lot of times we, we've had injuries and the injuries themselves sort of predispose us to painful arthritis or osteoarthritis um, as we age. You know, Brent, it's about 20% of all knee pain is related to being overweight and obesity. And there's a high correlation between ACL injuries and meniscus tip repairs and one out of three people developing osteoarthritis in the knee in their lifetime. And, and, it, and it, it's interesting to me, I just discovered that one half of all the 32.5 million people in the United States that have osteoarthritis, classified as osteoarthritis, Half of them are working adults from 17 to 64. So we have a big job to do. And osteoarthritis is a very, uh, it's a chronic condition, but under-recognized as it, uh, in its chronicity to the degree of impact upon work, um, a quality of life, and the things that we need to do to wrap our arms around treating this. And it's a multimodal approach. We have to do many things, but Fitness movement is considered the pain reliever for this area. Osteoarthritis. Yeah. And, that's the and, and, I can, and I can tell you just anecdotally, you know, and, and I mean, I know that's the case in science and the research shows it. Um, you know, both you and I have been dealing with knee pain and not willing to get a knee replacement. Uh, even though we've had successful hip replacements, the knee has been a little scarier for both of us. Right. We both had surgery in the knees, injections in the knees. But what I found recently is the last five months not traveling, I've been getting on my bike, just a stationary bike every day for half an hour. Mm -hmm. And I would say my knee pain has been reduced by, you know, 70, 80 percent just by conditioning my, you know, lower extremities with, you know, a, an exercise like that. So that's been, you know, that's been a very, you know, sort of telltale. And I know that with my Pilates and those things, they definitely got me through a lot of hard times right. uh, with my hip and back and things. But isn't it interesting that just really conditioning and strengthening the endurance of my lower extremities greatly reduced um, what is diagnosed osteoarthritis in my left knee. So, since, so the, since my first hip replacement, I've had a recumbent bike that travels with me everywhere. Wherever I live, my recumbent bike is with me. And I believe in cross training. I mean, you have to do aerobics. You've got to put the pressure. You got to put the pedal. Yeah, that was a piece I was missing, Beth. I, you know, I would do my Pilates and my stretching, and I, I sort of always, uh, you know, for me as a pole vaulter, long distance or endurance was 100 meters. Um, you know, I, I never really did cardio. And um, what a difference that makes. Oh, well, think about it. You know, running is not something that I'm going to do well anymore. And it doesn't feel good. Uh, and you mentioned before, I actually went to HSS this summer to see a doctor to get involved with the HSS. I just wanted to be a part of the HSS system. That's Hospital for Special Surgeries. Yeah. And I saw a doctor and we did some x-rays of my knee because I was complaining of pain. And I had some chronic inflammation there that we've taken care of. And he... He hadn't seen me, he'd only seen my x-rays. So he came in looking, expecting to look at something totally different. And I was still laying on the table and he looked at the x-rays and we looked at it and he goes, well, you're gonna need a knee replacement. I said, really? I don't think I'm close to being there at that point. Well, so why don't you get up and walk? So I went up and walked for him. He goes, well, you know what? You're an anomaly. You're, not, you're in that other side. You don't meet your, your x-rays. And you commonly speak about this, Brent, you know? where somebody comes in with an MRI and as, I, as they know the diagnosis, they're hopping in, but if they didn't know the diagnosis, they probably walk in fine. It's just one of those well, things. Even, even with that diagnosis and even with pain and even with MRI, the idea of jumping on you know, a good exercise program, losing a few pounds, doing some mm -hmm. cross training, 
keeping the mobility near the joints, right. working on strategy, can completely reduce the symptoms for years. I think this is this is sort of the message that we want to share. Now, there's a question that came in to us, Beth, from Carrie. She says, how is osteoarthritis diagnosed? And that's a great question. Um, okay. You know, typically we want to rule out any kind of systemic disease, right? So most um, most orthopedic rheumatologists and general practitioners, if they see that you're having multiple joint pain, they would want to run a couple blood tests and possibly take some X-rays to see if there's um, any kind of signs or some uh, you know pathology that they can pick up from their tests that would indicate the systemic arthritis as I was talking. So right. something like the R, the rheumatoid arthritis factor, or um, you know those kind of things. Now, when they rule that out, and it's it's a very simple, easy way to rule out, and they're looking at an X-ray, they're basically looking to see compromised uh, cartilage height in the X-ray. Right. That's right. So they're looking for joint space, and um, you know if you lose a certain amount of joint space, that's considered osteoarthritis, but it's not a you know a systemic disease. And um, that's that's pretty much the diagnosis. Now, the question that I always have is, if we just go out and do x-rays of everybody's body, we're gonna find normal degenerative changes that would be right. classified as osteoarthritis, right? I, you, you're not gonna take anybody in their 70s and do an MRI of their spine or their knees or their hips and not see some kind of compromise. Mm -hmm. You know of that. Now we might say that's a, that's a that's actually a really good joint space for a 70 year old, or we might right. not. Or I hear people saying, "Oh, my doctor told me I have knees of a 90 year old, you know, like 40 years old," and that's the worst kind of language a healthcare practitioner could use. Like that's we don't need that kind of language um, being out there. The question is, what can you do and what can't you do, and what do you believe you should be able to do? Right? That's the language you want to use. So then, right, Beth, we see people all the time come in that believe that they're, you know, they're being told by the physician what you were told and immediately go, okay, schedule me for a total knee replacement. And they're sort of like, but I, I'm maybe I'm not ready for a knee replacement. You know, that but, question doesn't come up. Yeah, that's the sad thing about osteoarthritis. And, you know, we don't have really good like really good preventive medicine that we're using enough for this condition. And there aren't a lot of stop and take it back steps that we can use. There's medication to cover the discomfort. It's what you do. Do you eat a, a diet that is a less of an inflammatory diet? Are you doing your exercise? Are you keeping good alignment and congruency in the joint? Are you conditioning the muscles around the joint to take the load off the joint? What are you doing that's going to help keep that space the best you can? And that's why I fell in love with Pilates, because that's what did it for me. But it didn't mean that I could still didn't lift a weight, and it didn't mean that I don't cross-train with my aerobics. It just means that this is a great way to get a whole body in a little bit better alignment so that you can work around it and take the stress off the joints from top, head to toe. And it's it's and people even my I'm, there's a question that just came in I, I that Melissa sent us one where Sarah asked what about people who have good mobility but a lot of pain as is often found in former dancers there you go why don't you answer that Brent <laughs> yeah well I mean I'm just raising my hand that it's you it's me it's yeah. you know 90 percent of the dance community you know it's like um, you know, it's interesting in classical dance, there's some good research that shows that the arthritic changes are not on the parts of the body that had um, high load, but often the part of the body that didn't have that high of a load. So if you're always in an externally rotated position, the degeneration could be in the part of the cartilage that wasn't getting good right. compression, decompression. Right. Um, you know, loss of alignment and congruency that Beth's talking about is also um, a very good cause for that. Now, you know what I what I don't understand. This is sort of part of Marianne's question on the next or the comment. Um, and I say that because genuinely, even in my own body, and I know you feel this too, Beth, is you know we just have to believe that we have to do the best we can do 
um, in our body and maintain as much um, quality of movement as possible. Now, here's some of my modifications in response to uh, Marianne. Your comment is like a beautiful mover and they go through a beautiful session and then a day later they're back to the compensatory patterns and you know having some pain for a couple of days and then it goes away and you know they get back. Um, simple things, for example, knee arthritis. Yeah. One of the things I realized was that I had um, an old ankle injury. One of my very first injuries was a fractured ankle, uh, pole vaulting my first year in college. And I rehabbed it, I had surgery, I had a screw in the ankle, but I, you know, for the most part, I didn't have any more pain with it. I was able to run again, I was able to do my exercises and hike and pretty much full activity. What was interesting though is years later when we really were looking at whole body mobility and distribution of movement as we talk about in whole stars mobility principle i realized that i had lost a significant amount of dorsiflexion in my left ankle and the day that i recognized that was after i had been suffering with left knee pain for about six months from doing a lot of squatting activities and so when I lifted my heel up a couple inches on a half roll, right. all of the symptoms I had in my knee went away and I realized, wow, this is a relational compensation. You know, my ankle didn't hurt at all, but the lack of dorsiflexion was causing me a tremendous amount of knee pain when I had never had knee pathology before. And, um, you know, and the same thing with the opposite hip. So a lot of times I think, that we need to look at distribution of movement as we talk about. For example, lumbar degeneration is probably due to poor thoracic mobility and poor hip and ankle mobility. Right. And I, I'm a, I would love to, you know, I'm hoping to submit some research and look at the correlation, which I think clinically has probably got to at least be 50, 60% of knee, low back, shoulder neck you know um, degenerative joint disease and pathologies are due to poor mobility of thoracic extension hip extension internal rotation and ankle dorsiflexion and you know this is this is something that we see chronically in a sedentary population so now putting things together back what what uh, Beth was talking about earlier this global almost epidemic pandemic of degenerative joint disease, right, which is osteoarthritis, degenerative joint okay. disease. And, you know, is it because we have become more sedentary? So cartilage needs to be compressed, decompressed. We need to be hydrated to be able to preserve the integrity of our cartilage. That's, we, we know that. So people that are sedentary, people that smoke, people that drink alcohol, people that drink a lot of caffeine are all cartilage depriving activities. Right. So let's think about our behavior of sitting 13 hours a day, drinking caffeinated drinks throughout the day, having a beer or a wine at night, and then, you know, um, smoking. You know, and even though we think smoking's on the decline, it's back up again. Our youth are defiant and they like to do harmful things to themselves, but smoking's on the rise again. There are, for example, if you go to HSS and you smoke, they won't do back surgery on you. Actually, it's vaping, a lot of vaping now that's creating a lot huh. of problems. Vaping. Same, same, same difference. Okay. It's not the smoke itself. It's like the nicotine and some of the other yeah. chemicals inside right. of tobacco that cause dehydration of cartilage. Right. And so these uh, a lot of the surgeons now have seen such a strong correlation with that that they're going like if you're if you're smoking and continue smoking I won't do surgery because it's going to fail. There's a 70% failure rate of doing a back surgery on somebody that smokes. They just don't want to. I, I don't know the number exactly, but it's high enough that the orthopedic and neurosurgeons are going like I don't want to touch I don't want to touch that surgery for my reputation's sake if you're smoking. So these are behaviors, right, Beth? I mean, that, yeah. you know, it, that we're it's seeing. Not, it's not easy to sometimes design an exercise program for somebody with arthritis. We have lots of questions coming in, but I do want to make this point. I find for other instructors who are learning to work with individuals with uh, different pathologies of the lower extremity, 
it's often difficult to find out how much is enough or how much is too little and find the right blend. And every individual is different. How, and somebody in one of these questions sort of brought that up. You could have the same two persons, the same two people, the same, the same exact profile, the same diagnosis, the same medial compartment knee arthritis, et cetera. But one's response to the movement is totally different than the other person's response to the movement. So there's no cookie cutter when it comes to developing a program for people with osteoarthritis. You have to work with the individual and know their tolerances, their pain tolerances, their level of uh, ability to move, their consciousness about movement, or their ability to maybe work through a little bit of discomfort to get to the pain-free side of arthritis. Because sometimes it's like a bell curve, you go up, and there's, it's difficult, and then when you can finally get your bell curve down, things get a little bit easier. And it's hard to find out how to get them over that bell curve so that they're they're feeling successful with their movement and they know that, all right, it may hurt for the few, first few reps, but then it's starting to just ease out now, it's starting to get better. And that's the difference with osteoarthritis than somebody else that you want to like, they're in pain and you want to guard their pain and you want to leave it alone and work around it. You have to kind of work through it with osteoarthritis a little bit. Yeah, I mean, you're not really, um, you know, even when I was, you know, as they would say, bone on bone in my hip, and that particularly was because I had had a previous surgery that, um, you know, removed the labrum and sort of scraped down some of the, uh, the cartilage around the joint and in the joint. And that was 20 years before I had had the total hip replacement. And, you know, isn't it interesting to me that, you know, one of the things that allowed me to go 20 years after that was continually challenging that joint. And after I had the surgery, the total hip replacement, you know, the surgeon was blown away that I had zero pain and that I had the range of motion I have. I think this is something that goes back to Marianne and also to Sarah's comment is that, you know, range of motion does not always correlate Right. Um, to the severity of the degeneration. So you could have really severe degeneration, but because you were a dancer or you're a mover or you've maintained, you've done good things to maintain the range of motion. And, you know, to me, there's a couple factors here. And this is something, again, I know Beth asked herself, and, you know, we're always looking for that magic cure. You know, can I take more curcumin? Can I, you know, are these magic injections that lubricate the joints? Um, you know, stem cells, I mean, whatever we can find to sort of uh, prolong, you know, what some might consider the inevitable. Now, the, the hip replacement is such a successful surgery these days that it's become a very easy pill to swallow, actually, where the knee replacement still is, uh, you know, it gets better, but it's not where the hip is. And so it's like trying to find the magic pill for, you know, the knee arthritis. And, you know, what I find is that the exercise, the distribution of movement, the cross training, the introducing the ranges of motion, uh, this goes into some of the work Juan Nieto is doing in Spain, where it's like, you know, challenge the joint carefully and consistently to, to be able to tolerate load. This right. ties into Erica asks us a question, uh, Beth, where she says, if either of us have um, had clients that have had, you know, osteoarthritis with you know, that manifests as wrist pain, right? So they're having a real hard time managing load. And I think one of the things that we have to um, maybe believe in our ability, what we do is this concept of plasticity, right? We talk about neuroplasticity where people have had strokes or have had um, different types of neurological impairments that if we treat, if we keep creating the demand and we keep, keep loading uh, the system, that the system will adapt and find a way to accommodate. And I think we have to think of the same thing with all of our body, right? Everything in our body is living. So, you know, the cartilage happens to require certain things to be healthy. And maybe we've done too much damage to it over the years that you know, it, it, it does need maybe a total joint replacement or it does need a debriding. But that what I'm finding is that tissue is adaptable, right? So even though I couldn't flex my knee all the way six months ago, I can now. 
is the arthritis going away? Is the arthritis less all of a sudden? You know, why am I able to do that? Well, it's because I don't have the same level of swelling or inflammation right. in that joint. Why? Because I'm conditioning, I'm taking better care of myself, I'm eating better, I'm, I'm trying to incorporate some anti-inflammatory um, food into my diet and uh, supplements into my diet. I, I don't know the exact reason, right? I'm not traveling as much. Um, but the, the reality is, is that most days I have pretty much full range of motion in my left knee, even though sometimes it looks like it's in another county when I'm walking. Um, the reality is, is that it's functioning quite well. I'm working out on the farm. I'm doing activities. I'm able to squat down and pull weeds and pick vegetables out of the garden. So things that I thought I would never be able to do again. So, you know, this is, this is the hope that I want to share today. And I know this is part of Beth's message too, is that, you know, just because you can't bear weight on your wrist today, doesn't mean that we can't create a modification of load program to gradually right, increase the load and tolerance to load until they can eventually do quadruped or planking posture without discomfort. And it might start where their hands are against a wall. It right. might start where their hands are on you know, a half roll or something that sort of supports the wrist. Mm -hmm. But it's the gradual loading over time that our tissues respond to, and they do respond, they do change, they do um, accommodate. And as Beth said, sometimes you're working through discomfort. Mm -hmm. And um, and I do that all the time. I know Beth does that all the time. Oh, I I, I definitely do. And, and, and on the wrist thing, I think I agree with you, Brent. You know, there are special now gloves that you can put a little silicone pad around the, of where the wrist is and it helps and gets the wrist up. So you got to start loading. I, I uh, have a real quandary when it comes to bathing clients too much yeah. and doing too much. And I think I think this, uh, I had several Zoom clients that you would have never expected would ever do what they did during, and these were people that were babied in the center and then they became extremely independent during this time. And it taught me even more the importance of people doing more for themselves and having to figure it out and 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 there was no way to cry and there was no way to you got to make this better or I'm, that doesn't work for me you're going to always have the timid ones there's going to be one some that are just never going to go there and that's that's who they are you have to accept that but for those that you can push a little further it's better to push them with osteoarthritis a little they got to get over the hump i can't say enough having two hip replacements and arthritis in my knee and a degenerative lower back the importance of of doing full body routines it, it's just it's so very important and getting well, as much range of motion and congruence as you can with the joints and keeping good alignment until you can go to very other variations is extremely important even in the medical literature there's no better prescription for osteoarthritis than exercise right. and and what we know as the movement experts is that a whole body, well-distributed movement is by far the best intervention. It might be that you modify range of motion and load in the beginning, but it's amazing to watch what happens. And this is a key point I hope you heard um, Beth say, and that is that we need to progress them, right? Uh, not to the point that we're inflaming them, right? There's a, and, and that's a trial and error thing. We don't, we don't know, you know, it's like we might flare them up, if they get better within 24 hours, I'm not worried about that. If they get flared up where they can't exercise for a week, then I probably went too hard and I got to back off a little bit, right? right? But I explain that to them in the beginning and I let them know, hey, you're not alone, you know? There's uh, what's the number again, uh, Beth, right now? What, what's our our incidence of osteoarthritis in the- In the United States, 32, two, 32 and a half million, and then that's up about 4 million over the last five years. Yeah, and, so we're seeing, uh, and that's, that's symptomatic. This is symptomatic that's, arthritis. That's symptomatic arthritis, and it's 303 million globally. Yeah. yeah so so it's, I mean, it's quite high. I we have a question here, Brent, um, and and also I wanted to make another comment to tag tail what you just said. You have to make your client your partner. They need to be able to help you determine 
how much is enough and not too much, okay? So if you, otherwise, it's all gonna be on your shoulders as the practitioner of Pilates. And that's not what you want. You have to say, look, I know what to do and I know how to do it and I'd like to get you there, but I need to know how your body's gonna respond to this. So you need to take some, I want, you have my permission to be a part of my team and let's be a team together and work together to find the right formula for you. And when you do that, it takes the onus off the instructor a little. I think that's a really good point. And then the that's question, such wondering. a good point. That's such a good point. And I tell that story all the time of, you know, the two scenarios of setting limits, right? Where the first one is saying, remember how one time we went a little far on your exercise program and you were sore for a couple of days and you came back and you noticed that and you, you sort of had an awareness of what that was going to be, like you knew what that feeling was. Um, you're ready to go back to running if that's what you wanted to do, let's say. And, you know, you have to listen to that, that feeling in your body. You have to have the awareness in your body. And so when they are able to listen to their own body, and we've had to use this with COVID, you know, we've had to educate them to be responsible to manage the intensity in their own body and to listen to their own body. And right. I think that's been one of the biggest lessons, as you mentioned, is that people have a much more capacity than we think. And when um, doctors and therapists and chiropractors, and we throw out these, you know, diagnoses that tell people, wow, you know, it's bone on bone. You know, I have a client right now, and I think Beth, you see her as well, but, you know, there's, um, you know, she was told she needed total knee replacements like eight years ago, both knees, and now she's traveled, you know, all around the world with her husband and has had lots of trips and she's not pain free. She has to manage things. She has to exercise. She has to do her Pilates. She, you know, walks a couple miles every day and, and, you know, bless her heart, she's taken that responsibility to stay active. And the other day she goes, do you think I'm ever going to need to get my knees replaced? And I looked at her and I said, you know, I think it's very likely that if you keep this activity level, you might never need to have your knees replaced. And she got a little smile on her face. But I think that, you know, education, 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 practice, practice, practice. I think passing the responsibility to the client. And Sarah brings up a point that we learned in the mindsetting course and the word yet. So when a client says, I can't bear weight on my hands, it's too painful. We say yet. So let's start off with, you know, the silicone yeah. pad. Let's start off with hands against the wall or hands against a chair before we go down onto the ground right. and start building that up. Let's start gradually bringing that into place. And remember too, that the idea of understanding pain, if we really think that the pain is due to arthritic pain, we know most arthritic pain gets better with movement in a matter of minutes. So I wake up in the morning with pain every day, but as soon as I get on the bike and I roll around on the ground within 15 minutes, you know, I don't have that pain. Um, I sort of know it's going to be there in the morning, but I'm not afraid of it anymore. I'm not taking anti-inflammatories anymore. Um, you know, I just know that that's sort of part of the generation and, you know, a certain age and the activities I had, but I also anticipate that that stiffness and soreness is going to go away in a few minutes in the morning. And that's a big differentiator we use in physical therapy right. between you know, systemic arthritis, which could last much longer, and osteoarthritis, which usually lasts, you know, usually within the first hour of the morning, can you have moving around, it's it sort of dissipates with movement. And that's exercise. actually that's actually a diagnostic code for diagnosing yep. arthritis. Uh, we have a question, Brent, I want to answer. Dr. Sure. Miller, what what experience have you had uh, with working with clients who's had stem cell insertions into joints, working with stem cell clients, when when uh, they are treated, how long did it last, able to dis so on and so forth. Anyway, I'll answer the question. I'm glad you take that one. Yeah, okay. So I have done stem cells two times in my uh, left knee. Um, the first time as I used uh, bone marrow and uh, bone marrow stem, stem cells and, and platelet-rich plasma. Um, and and uh, it was all inserted back into my knee. It was an overwhelming experience. It was early on, and uh, when you put and it was a too many cc's of stuff put back in my knee, and it was overwhelming to my D joint. Now 
I would say that I got about hmm, about 40% recovery though. It did help for about three or four years. And then I continued to have on a little bit more pain and I had um, stem cells done again, but I had amniotic fluid stem cells when it was allowable. And they were they were tested and in three different labs before I had them inserted in my knee, and they were very good, and I had a lot of great uh, benefit from them. But uh, I started having pain in February during COVID, and and it was actually from dancing for too many hours one night and too much rotation, and I inflamed myself so much that I just couldn't get rid of that inflammation because we you do go through these times where sometimes something grabs on you and it just won't let go and you start to have an extra symptom like going up and down the stairs more difficult and it just won't relieve no matter what you do and then you go and you try to find some assistance with that either to going on a course of NSAIDs uh, non-steroid anti-inflammatories or cortisone injections or Synvisc or something else uh, right now, stem cells are kind of on hold. The FDA is not really approving them, has not approved them for knees. It would be considered off-label, so to speak. So, um, and there's positive, there's positivity in the research, and there's not good research showing the efficacy is really there with in terms of the long-lasting effect. I did say I had stem cells twice, and it was very helpful for a period of time. Um, and I would say the amniotic stem cells were excellent. I'm waiting to see what's going to happen down the way for them. I think. I think we're doing an injustice by not allowing more of that, but I'm not sure where we're going to go because this, this, the research is just not there. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. And I mean, even my orthopedic surgeons that I work with and talk to, you know, a lot of them are doing things, you know, like the um, turmeric derivatives and, and uh, things like curcumin and, and um, you know, temporary fixes with the Synvisc and those kind of things for joints. Um, you know, but I, I still feel like the research is still very limited um, on that. There are a couple comments here. Um, uh, Naviv brings a, another look at um, arthritis, which has to do more with the, um, the image that we have in our body, talking about meditation and visualization of a healthy body. And part of this also can tie into the language I was talking about a little bit earlier of uh, pain and understanding what's pain's purpose. And understanding that, for example, um, arthritic pain is not necessarily doing damage to us. Um, a lot of times what we feel could be an acute inflammation from doing too much, um, as Beth talked about dancing, or when I've gone out and you know done too much work uh, with a weed eater or something like that, I will have you know three or four days that I realize I overdid it. And sometimes it's been so bad that I've had to go get an injection or do something you know, more medical on it. And, um, but I think the key thing is, you know, can we minimize the fear associated with osteoarthritis? Can we have a certain acceptance that life is not to be pain-free, but that we're looking at function? So a lot of times I ask questions, you know, what were you able to do yesterday? Were you able to do all the activities that you wanted to do yesterday? Yes. Do you feel like you're gonna be able to do all the activities you want to do today? No, I, I'm, I'm feeling a little sore. I can't quite do things. Do you feel like you might be able to do those activities tomorrow? Yes. So I started giving them parameters by the way that they ask the question and taking away the idea that, you know, this is horrible. I'm going to end up having knee surgery, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this leads to the next comment that came in from Angela. And Angela, you talk about having a client that has a meniscal tear. So let me let me just clarify something. There was a great study done on thousands of people that they did a match study. So they took people who had knee pathology and they matched in somebody who had no or knee pathology with pain and they matched them with people who were similar age, activity levels, who didn't have pain. And then they did the MRI and they looked at them. And it turned out that the people who didn't have pain had a higher incidence of meniscal tears than people who had pain. Um, so Again, there's this question of, do we hang our hat on this? Like you have knee pain, you go get an MRI, and the MRI comes back and says, you have a medial meniscal tear, right? What is that medial meniscal tear truly causing the mm -hmm. pain? Or is it coincidental that you're having some knee pain and you have an old you know, meniscal tear that 60% you know, of the population has or 30% of the population has? And so 
I think a lot of times we almost know too much. Now the question is, that person's having pain, according to Angela, when she kneels down, right? So she's having pain maybe in the bursa or the subpatella space that it hurts to do that, which probably has nothing to do with the meniscus, right. um, unless the meniscus is causing an acute inflammation, right? So I would treat the inflammation. I would try to keep get rid of the fluid that's inside the knee through some gentle movement with gentle ranges of motion and start gradually building up their tolerance, right? It could be that the meniscus is an acute tear, and it could be that it is causing so much inflammation that you know the knee stays irritated with those kind of activities. But it certainly is not the only possibility there. So you know, I would encourage gentle increase on weight bearing. Um, you can start, as you mentioned, with some knee pads. I think or is a good way to start something that's comfortable, tolerate. Um, we have so many abilities in the Pilates environment to modify load uh, that you know we can really make a big difference for them. Um, you know, with a high kneeling versus a low kneeling. So high kneeling with a tower bar versus a low kneeling on the reformer doing a knee stretch or something. So we can really modify those activities. Um, you also mentioned an increase in genu valgus, right? So genu valgus could be a structural thing having to do with the angles of the bone, but quite often it is a lack of ankle dorsiflexion and a lack of control of the hip internal rotation. And so what I do is I make the assumption always that things are strategically limited before I make the assumption they're structurally limited. And so I look to see if I can help re-educate the uh, the ankle dorsiflexion and re-educate the hip uh, control of internal rotation before I put a lot of emphasis on the knee where the discomfort is. And that way they don't even recognize it, but just teaching good bone rhythms, maybe some of Eric Franklin's work, or teaching good arthrokinematics of how dynamic alignment works inside the knee that we've talked about a couple of times on these webinars. Um, can make all the difference in the world and can greatly reduce genu valgus or genu varus. Um, we're running out of time, and I wanted, I wanted, um, Beth has been developing some coursework for us that is a continuation of her book, and I still want to be able to get to the last couple questions that have come in, but we have a video clip that um, I asked Melissa to prepare uh, that is a snippet from a new course that Beth is releasing in the next couple of weeks. And we thought that we would introduce that to you. Uh, Melissa, maybe now's a good time to show that video. While we're waiting for that video to come up, I see Carrie said, sounds like motion is lotion. And that's, that's a great uh, image. Yvonne said, thanks for the info on the stem cells and PRP. Sarah says, I read about possible correlations between cortisone injections and increased degeneration. Um, there is yes. some concern about that. Um, yeah. we, know, we know that, that that's a reality. Um, that's, that's in the literature. We try not to have more uh, cortisone shots than you know, one or two a year, if at all possible, because of that reason. What is a clinical diagnosis of hip OA that is performed by a physician and a qualified physical therapist for diagnosis? This is not done by a practitioner of Pilates, but it's important as a practitioner of Pilates to know what is the clinical diagnosis of hip away and how is it achieved? And that's what we're gonna take a look at. So in the clinical practice guidelines for hip pain and mobility that were revised in 2017, these were the things that were a major part of the clinical diagnosis of hip osteoarthritis. You had to show that you had hip pain, anterior pain. and lateral hip anterior pain and lateral hip pain at that least. there is hip flexion that there and is internal hip flexion rotation and hip deficit internal rotation this way. deficits you in this way show that you have you at have least to show that you have at least 15 degrees hip less flexion than the non painful side meaning this that if i have a an affected leg is right hip and i have to show at least 15 degrees less hip flexion in my right versus the left that is not the affected leg the same goes with hip internal rotation 24 degrees less than the unaffected leg. So I have to show that I have up to at least 24 degrees of limitation in hip internal rotation versus the non-painful side. 
they have to display that they have hip pain associated with a, a passive hip internal rotation and that there's morning stiffness that lasts up to at least one hour in duration after waking after waking and that their age is over 50. Now, I did not qualify for that over 50. I actually had hip osteoarthritis that was diagnosed with me in my in um, about 46. And I had my first hip replacement when I was 48, 49. So uh, I didn't meet that because I had a condition that sh showed up a lot sooner than it should have in theory for a wear and tear disorder because mine was, mine was more of a developmental problem. And so it showed up earlier in life than 50. So that you don't always have to meet each one of these, but these are definitely pieces that they took a look at when doing a clinical diagnosis. So again, just a little snippet. And I think that, you know, we're looking at some valuable information, um, you know, specifically designed by Beth for the Pilates and movement teacher. Therapists can benefit from as well as far as exercise prescription and sort of understanding, you know, what, you know, what are some of the parameters to have the right language. I think this is a really important thing. The medical community, and this is where Beth and I communicate quite often, the medical community wants to know that, you know, we as Pilates teachers are able to use the same language and talk about things and to really be the people that can provide a safe exercise program, um, especially for people with osteo. Uh, Arthritis, like it's such a such important thing. Um, I have another question here, a comment from Suzanne. It says, "Is there a difference between arthritis that is hereditary or not?" Um, I'm in waiting and in pain for hip replacement. Dancer, big mover, sleeper, uh, caregiver, feeling uh, really down. Um, you know, Suzanne, uh, most of us go through that have been you know movers. Um, you know, when the when the pain gets to be too bad in the joint, and you sort of know when that is. And patients ask me all the time, when do I need to get a hip replaced? And, you know, to me, it's sort of like when you've exhausted all of your resources, you really put your energy into, you know, moving as best you can and maintain a quality of life. And you feel like the quality of life is being reduced by 25, 30 percent. We used to say 70, 80 percent. Um, we don't say that anymore because the total hip replacements are so successful and allow us to do, you know, I, there's nothing I can't do. I, the, the mental thing that I had in my head for the hip replacement was, you know, I want to be whole. And I confused the idea of, you know, having all my body parts versus having all my body function. So, you know, when you're looking at this, Suzanne, and you, you, you know, really, and I'm sure a lot of people are listening are in the same boat as you, and Beth and I have both been there and gone through that ourselves, that there's a point where you know. This was a this was a question that I really liked in my relationship with my surgeon, Dr. Suarez, was, you know, he was very clear to say, look, the x-ray is not diagnosing when you need to have surgery. Um, it just confirms that there's degenerative changes that that warrant it if your quality of life has been compromised. And the only question I put out to my clients is, have you done everything to be able to have the best quality of life in spite of that degeneration or that injury? And if they have and they're still compromised, then I feel like it's time for them to do some consulting uh, for some surgeries. Beth, any other advice you would give Suzanne? Well, so then, you know, you'll know when it's time to do a hip replacement. You know, you did ask if there is there a difference between arthritis that is hereditary or not. It all turns out to be osteoarthritis as long as it's osteoarthritis, whether it's hereditary or not, whether it's due to a mechanical situation, an overload situation, an injury, or just the fact that you have more of a hereditary genetic type of osteoarthritis. You still need to get good alignment, good congruency, and keep everything strong around the joint to take the load off of it. And you'll know when it's time, you'll know, it, it, it comes automatically. I do wanna say that what you saw on the clip before was one of five chapters of an online course on the learning management system of Polestar that you can go on and take. It's about a two and a half to three hour course, about two hours of videos and about 15 exercises and to get you started with osteoarthritis of the hip, 
and some handouts and great resources of information. So this is the beginning stages of developing educational workshops on various topics. And this one's on OA of the hip, and we'll follow it up with OA and the knee. There's a lot of questions coming in, Brent, that we're not gonna get to all of them. And I would love to get to all these questions. Yeah, so, and, I, and I think it's important to understand, you know, the the education system is gonna be, uh, what we're excited is on the new Polestar platform that Beth has created the uh, content for. And it also will be feeding into her on-site course that will also have virtual attendance capabilities for people remotely that can attend you know, a weekend course. So um, a lot of great things in the works. And I think that you know, this is so prevalent. Like we all deal with it ourselves and all of our clients deal with it. And um, you know, like you said, the questions are continuing to come in. Um, you know, we're out of time today, but we want to keep bringing you good content and good information. Uh, Beth also has a book uh, on this, and uh, that book has been out for a while. It's in multiple languages in multiple countries. When Melissa sends out the follow-up on this, we'll do a couple things. Um, one, uh, we'll give you the link for the book. We'll give you the link for the new workshop that you just got a taste of. Um, we're hoping that we'll be live with that by the 15th, but it might be the week after that. We're work, we're waiting right now for uh, the PMA CECs so that you can take Beth's course and also get the continuing education credits uh, for the PMA and definitely for Polestar. And, uh, but we are going to give you a special deal. So uh, Beth and I talked about it, and um, you'll see that we'll give you a, a special discount, as we always do. There'll be a couple weeks to... If you register in the next couple of weeks for that course, you can uh, get a special Polestar Pilates Hour pricing on that. Uh, it's called the pre-order. So uh, Melissa will send you that information with the uh, post-webinar links. Um, also, we'll probably throw in a couple articles uh, that are out there that you can look at. Uh, we want to continue to have questions from you. Um, a great place to ask those questions will be in some of the other synchronous workshops that Beth or I might be conducting in the future. Uh, we appreciate you attending and hanging out with us today. Beth, Absolutely. I want to especially thank you. I know you've put so much work and energy into this. Is there any last thing you'd like to share with the group before we finish up today? Well, I just love to share the knowledge that I've received from my own personal experiences, but from that that I've learned from my clients. And, and I think, I love working with Polestar because you have given me the opportunity to put this together in a place where I can share it with others, like this workshop that I wrote during, by the way, this was done during COVID time and I filmed everything myself and then had the web manager put it all together. So it was one of those things where I said, I have to do this. This is a very difficult subject to talk about osteoarthritis, as I can see from all the questions. And there's so much that goes with it. And it's a very misunderstood chronic condition and under-recognized in many ways. So I'm very happy to have been here today and be with all of you. And it, it warms my heart to know that so many of you were here asking such valid questions. And I really hope that one day I can get to all of them for you. And, and we'll keep putting things up. Like maybe what we'll do, Beth, is, uh, you know, in a month or two, we'll have one just on the knee and one just on the hip and the shoulder. And we'll okay. you know, bring in very specific joints that we can talk about. And um, what I'd love to hear from the audience is just, you know, if you'd like to, you know, be able to do more of a QA and a on, um, you know, different pathologies that are coming your way in a body region and mm -hmm. to be able to talk about them. You know, we've talked about principles of movement. Next week, I'm going to be talking about alignment and I'm going to be talking specifically about alignment of perception. So, you know, um, get ready. We're just continuing to go down through our principles of movement. So hopefully you'll join me next week. Uh, but, you know, we want to continue to bring you information that you're interested in. So I read through the survey that a lot of you filled out and sent back to us. And that gave me a lot of great ideas that uh, I'll continue to invite guests and bring in some special content that you're asking for. So, again, thank you very much for joining us for the Pilates Hour. Thank you, Beth, for joining us. Thank with you for having me. You're welcome. And uh, as always, thank you, Melissa, for making this possible for us. You're, uh, yes. We don't often see Melissa, but these things don't happen without Melissa. So um, she, she makes it happen. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Be safe, wear your right. mask, and, uh, and have a great weekend. 
Goodbye, everybody. Sorry, my video wasn't working. <laughs>